continuing our discussion about the right man, and of course that means Jesus, our point is the gospel is revealing Christ. It's not revealing us. And so as we find ourselves in Christ, then it's a very life-changing revelation, of course. So today I want to talk about the two paths that we find in Matthew chapter number seven. It says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. You know, this has been an interesting verse for a lot of people, and I hear people say things like, well, you know, not many people are going to go to heaven, or, you know, there's this implication that the devil is going to win, and most people that are, uh, you know, have lived and died even and who are alive today, most people are going to go to hell. You find this is a very popular topic with some evangelical, you know, uh, preachers, and and so I want to address this today because I don't believe the devil is going to beat God at anything. I believe the devil is a loser. I believe God can't be beat, especially by the devil. And so uh, I want to sort of just take this thing and, and uh, you know, work it around a little bit and share some things with you. But there's no shortage of commentaries uh, of people, even you can find them online by the droves, who are supporting this idea that this is somehow very difficult to find yourself on this path. Um, so I read this uh, even today, this commentator's writing, and he says, how do we find this gate, the entrance to this narrow way? It's not because we are exceptional people or doing something that makes us deserving to find it. So I agree with that. That's a, that's that's perfectly articulated. That is the truth. It's not because of us. Remember, Jesus is the point of the gospel, not you. So we put him in the center of this passage and not ourselves, and it starts to make more sense. But here again, the same writer, now he shifts gears and says this, but once we see the narrow gate, there's something we must do before we can start to walk on the narrow way that leads to life. Can I tell you, unless you meet Jesus and are born again, you don't know what changes to make. There's nothing you can do. You're still lost in your sin. This idea that somehow we're supposed to qualify ourselves by what we do or put things down or, you know, clean up before we take this spiritual shower, if you will, it's just nonsense. This is a great example of somebody just falling back into religion and identifying that Jesus is the only hope here, but then going right, right back into our own effort to make us somehow positioned to where we can receive this. Let me tell you, the Bible says that when we were dead in trespasses, that Jesus died for us. That means when you're dead, you can't help yourself. There's nothing you can do. You can't, you can't uh, do anything to prepare yourself for this walk. He uses Philippians 3, 7, and 8 as his proof text here. And it says this, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Now he's talking, Paul's talking about things that he's esteemed as loss or that he's counted as loss or he's, you know, he's discerned as not important for his own life. This is after he's met Jesus, okay? And it goes on to say, uh, yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So again, Paul is not saying that he has to do this before he gains Christ. It is He is saying that he wants to grow in the things of God. And it also, you know, he's he, he's talking about this, this personal development within the revelation of who Jesus is and his salvation. So these things, he's, he's, the word gain there also means to profit or to benefit. So he's not saying, I have to do this to, to get saved. What he's saying is, I'm putting things down now that I am saved so that I can grow in the things of God. You see, that's a very great thing to do because we mature. You know, when we were children, we we were childish. And now that we're adults in spiritually speaking, according to Paul and Corinthians, now we're putting down childish things and we're growing into the people that God has ordained us to be. That's all he's saying here. But this writer goes on to say, this means we have to leave behind certain things that God points out that will hinder us from walking on this way. All right. And he goes on to make this 
sort of comes back around to the fact that you can't even get on the way with Jesus until you do these things. Can I tell you the only way you can make those kinds of decisions is when you are walking with Jesus. It's the only way that you even know what's right and what's wrong. But again, the Bible is not about behavior modification. As we focus on Christ, the things that hinder us fall away. It's not even something you need to spend a lot of things about. Paul's like, I count them as rubbish. He's just running headlong into the things of God. That's all that you have to do. You don't sit there and make a a laundry list of all the things you want to stop doing because I guarantee you, we've all done it. I want to quit doing this and quit doing that and quit doing this. And before you know it, that's all that you're doing because you're thinking about the wrong thing. You're thinking about the things you want to stop doing instead of the things that you want to do in Christ. So if we just think about him, if we renew our mind to the goodness of God as we do those things, then I'm telling you all the other things fade away. I've lived this reality. I'm not perfect, and I still have things that I'm believing that are going to fall off of my life, but the things that have fallen away from my life aren't because I'm focusing on them to to do something about them. It's because I'm spending more time focused on how much God loves me, how much he's called me to do, and just focused on the goodness of God that never changes. So now, people who think that this narrow way is very difficult and very hard and very few people are going to find it, ask yourself this question, why did God make salvation so difficult? And if you really think about how we you know, discerned verses like this, it's because we feel like we're supposed to do something to position ourselves or to do something to make us earn this, even when we say out of the other side of our mouth, we know that this is not about works. We fall into this trap very easily if we're not paying attention. Paul admonished the Galatians time and again about not getting sucked back into something they were already delivered from. And this is kind of the concept that we see swirl around this passage in Matthew that we started with, okay? So in Matthew eleven twenty eight and 30, listen to this. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's verse 28. Verse 30 says this, and of course, Jesus is speaking here. He says, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So how do you how do you square this idea that very few people are going to be born again with Jesus saying that my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and I will give you rest. See, it doesn't jive. And so you have to start being critical in your thinking about what exactly is going on here. I've always thought that if it was too difficult for me, that I'm doing it wrong because Jesus is saying that it's easy and light. And I think sometimes we we put it on ourselves that we think serving God, man, this ought to be some kind of drudgery. You know, we ought to pay some kind of penance. This ought to be boring and dull. And I think that's why people go to boring and dull churches and listen to boring and dull people tell them boring and dumb things because, you know, everybody's just loving this suffering and this sacrifice. I don't, I think God wants us to have a good time. I think this ought to be the greatest adventure of life. And it's truly knowing who he is, how he feels about us, and the fact that that he has done the work. And now we are resting in him. And the only thing the Bible ever tells us to labor for is to enter into his rest. It's a beautiful revelation of the life God has established for us by his own sacrifice, okay? Let's go to Revelation chapter number seven, verses four and nine. And it says this, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And you know, and some people actually think, oh, well, you know, only 144,000 people are gonna go to heaven and blah, blah, blah. And there's a lot of silly people out there that should just, keep reading because that's verse four. And in verse nine, it says, and after these things, after those people show up, and this is, you know, there's some things happening there. It says, after these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands. And so here's a number that no one could number. 
So it doesn't seem to me like there's very few people in heaven. In fact, it's a number nobody could number. So this idea that, oh, you know, the devil's going to win and so many, you know, everybody's going to go to hell. I think people are going to be absolutely shocked and surprised at the people who are in heaven when they get there. And I think that's a very powerful promise that we see from Scripture. So it doesn't look like it's the way we tend to think about that verse in Matthew uh, where we started today. So um, here's the thing that has happened in that passage in Matthew 7, 14. Uh, Jesus is the few. The word there for few, that few there be that find the path. That word few in the Greek means as few as one. And Jesus was the one. The, 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 the road was narrow. The road is difficult. There was nobody that could find that road except one. And his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And because he found that road, guess what he did? He established himself as the door. You see, it's a very exclusive thing uh, that Jesus establishes here. The God, people say, well, because Jesus is the only way, the gospel is very exclusive to just Christianity, and it's very limited and all of that. And, and so, yes, it's a narrow thing because Jesus is the only way. But the gospel is also very broad because Jesus, once he established himself as the door, as the way, as the path, he said, whosoever. And because he said whosoever, religion doesn't matter here. We're talking about a a relationship with the king. And your background doesn't matter. Your Hey, believe it or not, it, listen, listen to me, all you wokesters out there. The color of your skin doesn't matter. All that matters is that Jesus Christ died for you. He paid a price for you. He did something you could never do, your politicians could never do, your you know activists could never do, all the people that represent you could never do. He paid the price. And if you have whosoever, if you have faith in him, then the Bible promises that you are going to live forever in eternity with your heavenly father. It's faith alone. And faith is not a work, it's a rest. So when you start walking this this way, which is Jesus, you don't have to first do anything. You have to believe. And that's not a doing, that's a being. That's a rest, it's not a work. And so yes, the gospel is very narrow in that perspective, but it's very broad because anybody is welcome. And let me just say this, uh, last week we talked a little bit about this idea that you could lose your salvation on Saturday night and have to run down to the altar and get it again on Sunday morning, lest you be vomited out of the mouth of God. And that's nonsense. And and it's a, it, it's, it's unfortunate that people who love God would disparage his name so completely that they would try to convince his children that he would turn his back on them eternally because they didn't show up for church or they didn't do what the preacher wants them to do. This is the the, the nonsensical world in which we live, but the broadness of the gospel is being a whosoever. And if you're ever and have ever been a child of God, if you've ever called upon the name of the Lord, let me tell you today, as much as that moment that you did that, you are a child of God. You say, well, I don't feel like it. Well, I'm going to encourage you to disconnect from your feeling and let your faith in the word of God take the day. It doesn't matter how you feel. We need to get over our feelings. We need to realize God's called us here to to triumph over feeling, to lead our emotions, not be led by them. This nonsense in our in our society that everybody's you know uh, upset about everything and everybody's got to have their feelings just in check that's nonsense. The devil is manipulating people through their feelings that he's robbing their destiny. And you know what? So many people are going to wake up in heaven when they die and be so surprised. And unfortunately, they're going to have had most of their life stolen by the devil and their feeling that they didn't measure up. Nobody measures up. We need to get over that idea that we're going to measure up to God. The only way you and I measure up is through Jesus Christ, and that's it. That's how it works. So John 3, 16, let's talk about the broadness of the gospel for a moment. The the word says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Notice he didn't love the church. He didn't love Christians. He didn't love you know a set type of person. He loved the world. He didn't come for the church. He came for the world. 
So if we're having conversations with ourselves and not speaking the language of our world in such a way that they could know that they're loved, then we're doing something wrong. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So all you have to do is believe here, we see it. Again, in Acts 2.21, it says, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is, you know, again, we're just showing here how God has made a way for people just simply by faith to receive salvation, which is eternal. John 10, verse nine, listen to this, Jesus speaking. He says, I am the door, and if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. That idea about finding pasture means that we find rest, we find uh, sustenance, we found provision. He's watching over us as a shepherd does sheep. You know, and so his plan for you, my friend, is good, not evil. He he's gone before us. He's made a way for us to be accepted by our Father in heaven, and you are a joint heir with Jesus. And the Bible says that God has given into our hearts his spirit that cries out, Abba Father. So you and I know by faith in Christ, we are established, we are qualified, and we are loved for all eternity. And that is the truth. And my friend, Jesus is the center of that equation, not us. We are there simply because God loved us so much that he refused not to take action on our behalf. While we were dead in trespasses, Jesus died for us. (laughs) 